I do feel the pressure. I do feel like this is my second album or something. And one thing that I do just in my creative process, I'm sure a lot of people do the same, is like I come up with all these ideas and then I keep going to make sure that like I know that the one that I think is the one is actually the one. I'm Brandon Dawson, and this is The Distiller, a podcast about how we find meaningful work and how we find meaning in the work we do. My guest for this episode is bar owner, bar designer, bartender, and hospitality consultant, Julia Pettiprin. You may recall that we recorded episode 15 with Liz McEwen at Sundry and Vice here in Cincinnati. Julia was our host for that episode. She moved to Cincinnati five years ago to open Sundry and Vice with her business partner, Stuart King. These days, Julia is deep in the midst of preparation to open a brand new venture, and I'll let her tell that story in her own words a little bit later. Most of us, if not all of us, have been to or spend time in bars and restaurants, but what goes into the process of conceiving and planning and opening a new bar? What questions and processes are involved? And how does someone who's had success with one venture handle the insecurity of the next venture? All of that and more is right where Julia is right at this moment. Maybe the most unique aspect of this episode is that we're not sitting in some cushy booth. Julia and I met in her new place, which is currently under construction as we speak. We borrowed stools from 16-Bit, the arcade bar down the street, thanks to them, brushed the construction dust off a work table to set up our microphones, and we sipped drinks Julia pulled out from her bag and mixed right there on the spot. Check out Angie Lipscomb's beautiful photos of our conversation and for a look at this new venture in its very early stage at our website as you listen at thedistillerpodcast.com. So let's get into it. From the construction site that will become Cincinnati's newest bar, here is my conversation with Julia Pettiprin on The Distiller. Well, thank you so much for having us in. Everybody, if you're um, listening, this is a little bit of a an unusual episode in that usually we are recording in a bar or a restaurant or a coffee shop somewhere. Today we are recording in a bar to be, um, the shell of a building in Over the Rhine in Cincinnati <laughs> that in, what, three months? Hopefully. Yeah, June? Yeah, yeah. Okay, That's recording in goal, March. if everything goes as planned. All right. So you and, know how that goes. And my guest, Julia, is the owner, one of the co-owners of uh, this bar, the, the name of which was just publicly announced like last week. <laughs> yes. So tell us, tell us about your concept, first of all, and, and just the highlights, because I want to get, we'll get into the, okay. the nitty gritty, but tell us where we are and yeah. what it's going to be. Um, well, where we are specifically, as in the address? No, no, no. Just this, okay. this place that Homemakers. we're in. Homemakers. Yes. Okay. The bar is called Homemakers. All right. Which is, um, it's been a fun thing to share with people because everybody has a different reaction. Yeah. I haven't heard anybody say they hate it, but I get a lot of chuckles, <laughs> which, has been, which has been fun. Uh-huh. Um, and it, it's really about the, the joining of my new partner, Catherine Manavet, and myself. Mm-hmm. We're both not from Cincinnati, so we moved to Cincinninati both with the thought that we would leave, yeah. and we both fell in love with Cincinnati and decided to stay and make it our home. There you go. So that's one of it, okay. one of one of the pieces. And then the other piece is the maker's portion, which totally fits in with what you do yeah. and what you're trying to, the stories that you're trying to tell. Hmm. Um, it's celebrating the people who make things and why they make things and... Cool. Yeah, that cool, maker cool. movement. And I read as well uh, that it's going to be... Um, what was it? Low proof cocktail focused. Yeah. What is the, What does that mean? <laughs> it means you can come here and drink all day and still drive home. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there's there's um, a bunch of in major markets. There mm-hmm. are already bars that have this sort of beverage program um, happening. Mm-hmm. So we're bringing that to Cincinnati as well, and we're we're definitely going to have. Bourbon and whiskey, all the regulars, and, and all the all the regular things. Yeah. Um, but for those people who like to come hang out, have a couple of drinks, and not have to worry about how they're getting home, yep. or um, you kind know, just keeping IPA that level version. Yeah, it's yeah. like that. A lot of people do call them session cocktails. Right. Okay. So it's what just is, a similar thought. What is the definition? I'm going to take a total tangent because yeah. I'm interested. What is the definition of a session? cocktail or a session is it just lower alcohol yes it's like it's sessionable like you can drink it real really okay. easy all right um i like to call them crushable okay yeah i like that yeah yeah all right 
So essentially, let's step back a little bit and do the historical build so that yeah. we, uh, eventually we get back to where we are. You moved here in 2014. Yes. From Los Angeles. Correct. To open a bar. Correct. To open Sundry and Vice. That is correct. Which we recorded. You were kind enough to host us for, I think it was episode maybe 14 with Derek Dos Anjos. Yeah. No, it was, oh. it was Liz. I'm confusing my es- episodes. Right. It so, was, yes. Yeah, it was Liz McEwen yeah. uh, that you hosted us for that episode. Yep. Lovely place. You moved here, started that place. Mm-hmm. Um, tell me a little bit, because as I, you know, I looked at your LinkedIn and I'm reading the articles about the announcement for homemakers, you have a background in design. Yeah. Not necessarily mixology or bartending. <laughs> that, yes. It doesn't seem like that's where you came from. So I, I have a background in both. Okay. So basically... I'm from Michigan originally, which I think it's important to share because mm-hmm. some of the um, articles have just said that I'm like from Los Angeles, which right. I am not, but okay. I did live there for a very long time. So I moved uh, to Los Angeles in 2004. Mm-hmm. Um, and like most of the people who moved to Los Angeles um, at a young age find it easy to, you know, get involved <laughs> with bars and restaurants yeah. to pay their bills because you get cash. Yep. Cash tips, and that is like a reasonable way to pay your bills there. Sure. So I did that. Mm-hmm. Um, what did What did you move to LA for? Um, Just to get away, or was there a, like a like a plan? I mean, I'm from Flint, so it was mostly just to get out of Flint. I went, yeah, I just had a friend that was going, and I was like, okay, let me just hop in the car with you and hit the road. Absolutely. So I did that. Um, And so being there, I got a job as um, a server, Mm -hmm. and then um, I was just kind of like, I was playing music, so maybe I went there with stars in my eyes. Okay. Is this something you still do? This and is... Not at all. Okay. <laughs> not at all. I like to shove it way deep down inside, <laughs> pretend like it never happened. We're going to do some internet sleuthing, see if we can <laughs> yeah, pull out exactly. the old recordings. No, oh, I... please don't. No. Um, so, anyway, so I moved there. I did, like, you know, I found a couple of musicians to start a band with, but mm-hmm. I was mostly just serving, and then I made my way to bartender. And then... I just, to be honest, I didn't really like the music scene. Yeah. It was very businessy, and it just wasn't as fun as I thought it was going to be. And it's a, it's a, it's a. I mean, cesspool is the word that comes to mind, and maybe a kinder. <laughs> I, I am an erstwhile musician too, uh-huh. and I remember as a songwriter, the first time I flew into LA, I just thought, "There's a thousand people within." That two block yeah. area who are trying to do what I'm trying to do. Yeah. It'd be a hard place. Yeah, it was crazy. I mean, yeah, yeah you could, like, if you're on, in Santa Monica, you could literally walk down the Third Street Promenade and, like, see all these yep. people that you were trying to make it, you yeah, know, yeah. make it big. All your competition. Yeah, exactly. But anyway, it was fine because I was just having a great time um, bartending in Los mm-hmm. Angeles, hanging out, living in the sunshine. Yeah. And then at some point I was like, okay, maybe I should really focus and decide what I want to do with my life, which is when I decided to go to school for interior design okay. out there. So simultaneously making my way through the hospitality industry and getting into the design world. Gotcha. Yes. Okay. So what leads to you moving to Cincinnati to open Sundry and Vice? So basically I was working, I was bartending Mm -hmm. and I had had a couple jobs in the design field. um, But to support yourself, I still had to bartend. Like even if I was working full time with an interior designer, Mm -hmm. I still, I wasn't able to make enough to pay my bills. So I would be doing both. Um, And then I kind of just, I'm just an entrepreneur at heart. And I was like, gosh, I'm going to just kind of try to do this on my own. Let's see what happens. So I got a couple jobs out there just through people that I know in the hospitality industry. Mm -hmm. Um, I did like some styling stuff. I designed, I did like, um, I did a decorating job. And then I did like the projects just started growing and getting bigger and bigger. Um, So it kind of all happened naturally. And then. Um, the last thing that happened, which prompted the move here, is that um, my colleague and friend met somebody who actually was living in the building that I was working in and I didn't know. And they started talking about opening a bar in Los Angeles. Okay. 
they brought me on as the interior designer, mm -hmm. and we started looking at spaces in downtown Los Angeles. Okay. So we looked at a couple spaces, then like basically the what ended up happening was, well, this is going to be super expensive. This is a huge risk. Yeah. The market's, you know, sort of becoming saturated already. Mm -hmm. So we were kind of, they were going to throw in the towel and I was going to lose my design job. Right. Right. <laughs> and um, the last thing that happened was Stuart King, who mm -hmm. is my business partner at Sundry and Vice. He was like, well, I do have this other idea, but it would have to happen in Cincinnati. And we were like, okay. That's because he had roots here? Or? Yeah. So Stuart okay. is actually from um, outside of Dayton. Okay. Yeah. Like by Springfield or yep. Enon. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. One, yeah. Of the, one of the little. One of those little places over uh -huh. there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So he used to work for the Reds. He knew about what was happening in Cincinnati. He knew about the Renaissance that was okay. happening. So it was his idea. Mm -hmm. um, and like, I mean, so <laughs> he, Stu actually says that this which I find funny. <laughs> it, when you hear the word Cincinnati, like when you don't know anything about Ohio or whatever, it kind of sounds like lettuce. Like, you know <laughs> what I mean? Like it doesn't, it evokes like no emotions. You're that just is like, absolutely true. Yeah. yeah, before I moved here, yeah. I said that before, I had zero frame of reference. Not good, not bad, just right. empty. Yeah, like lettuce. Yep, yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> Iceberg lettuce. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's what happened to us. We're like, oh, we have no feelings about Cincinnati. So, um, yeah, let's go fly to Cincinnati, mm -hmm. pitch to 3CDC, see the city, check it out, um, which we did. And, I, I mean, like, I saw the beauty in Cincinnati right away. I think many people do, especially when you come to the Over the Rhine yeah. neighborhood and you see all the architecture and the history, you're just like, wow, okay, all right, Cincinnati, you right. know? Yeah, there's, there's a lot here, a lot of history, on. a lot of personality. Yeah, so we pitched a 3CDC, um, flew back mm -hmm. to L.A., and uh, the operator, my friend, who brought me in, like, as the designer, essentially, was like, wait a second, I don't want to move to Cincinnati, so I'm out. Okay. And so the project was about to fall apart, and basically me just you know, always jumping on any opportunity that I that I can see was like, well, that's sad to see this just all fall apart. I'm from Michigan. What if I just move there for a year and I just help open Sundry and Vice? And then okay. I design it and I'm like essentially the operator mm -hmm. and I open it and I get it running for a year and then I bounce. Okay. And that's what brought me here. Best laid plans. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and talk about, uh, I. it's funny, I remember that first press release. Yeah. Uh, the first Sundry and Vice press release and, you know, hearing that the bar was going to be open. I think it was because it was touted as an apothe apothe apothecary themed, <laughs> sorry, that word just caught me, apothecary themed bar. And it was a new concept mm -hmm. um, for Cincinnati. And I yeah. remember that. You come here, you're going to stay for a year. Yep. What happened? I mean, obviously the the bar did great. I was just in the research, you know, it was one of Thank two you. Cincinnati bars that was voted best bars in the world. Yeah, like best bars in the world. Right, <laughs> by a publication called Best Bars in the World. <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is great, but still, it, it's a, a lovely place. And Thank you. And you, you made it what it is, a fantastic spot. Describe the process of you're here, you're opening a bar. How How was it? A struggle at first, or did it kind of hit the ground running? Um, yeah. I, well, we had been already developing the bar for a year, about a year before either of us moved here. Mm -hmm. um, so that whole, we, we kind of did that from from L.A. Yep. There, just, I started to design, to design it there. Um, and then, I mean, we just like, mostly, okay, so when you open a bar and restaurant, or restaurant, it's like at the beginning, and I'm sure this is the way with most businesses, but uh -huh. like you're meeting so many like sales people. Right. Like it's like, oh God, if I have to sit, and you know, because you can't just meet, like if you're buying a point of sale system, yeah. you can't just meet with one point of sale guy. You have to meet with everybody. So you have to meet with all these people and you're just taking meeting after meeting and it's like, I don't, where is my time? Like, where does it go? So it was yeah. a lot of that. Um, initially in Los Angeles. And then we moved here. And then, um, I mean, basically that was my, the only thing I had to do 
which was great and necessary because it was like a full-time job. Basically just finished doing the finishing details on the design. I moved here in January. We opened in March. Okay. So That's pretty quick. Yeah. So there wasn't much time. So basically we started interviewing people, um, which was interesting because, you know, not knowing anybody, you're just like, you can't lean into your network. Yeah. Yeah. So you're just like, how do we find these people? And, you know, we use Craigslist a lot, which, you know, can be hit or miss. And like, I'm not even sure if there was like, now there's like Facebook groups for bar and restaurant and like all of those things specific to Cincinnati. But, you know, we didn't have that. So we were just like me, I was like out to make friends. So Mm -hmm. I was like, my first like regular bar spot was Liberty Bar and Bottle. I love uh-huh. those guys. They became my like first friends. Right on. Um, and then that's like, your just, hangout when you're not working because you don't want to. Yeah, well, hang out at your own spot. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And then before it opened, I mean, you know, I was like, bartenders, you're my people. Like, yeah, yeah. Let's chat. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the process all happened pretty pretty rapidly and. And then next thing you know, we're, like, opening. Mm-hmm. Like, the day we get our liquor license yeah. is, like, the day that That's we open. That's opening. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, like, this whole maybe two-week beforehand period where it was, like, hurry. It was, like, wait, wait, wait. Like, not yet, take, not the, yet. take the next necessary steps, but... It's okay. And then all of a sudden it was like, go, 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 go. <laughs> it was like sprinting to the finish line. And you're like, I don't know if I can swear on here. You can, it's okay, it's the internet. You can swear. I swear on you. Um, but yeah, it was like, shit. Okay. It's like now we're opening today. And like right. literally our wine arrived that day. Our liquor arrived that day. All the like little bottles that you see in our front windows. We were setting those up that day. Wow. It was just like all these final things. And like we had all the employees in there and they were like helping us set the stuff up, but like they didn't know what to. So, and I was you like. You the trained po- them on the menu. Oh yeah. Oh, well, we did. We had actually a very nice extensive training <laughs> at Sundry and Vice, which, um, which is why I think that they're, they're able to like manage those stressful okay. moments with those crazy cocktails. But... <laughs> But even though we had trained them and I knew the cocktails, that first day we were open, I'd made every single cocktail yeah. wrong. So I apologize if you came in that day. <laughs> I didn't come in the, the opening day. I never had anything but a good experience there. Yeah, great. Yeah, because I, I messed up a bunch that first day. But still, a great place, great Thank vibe, you. always always wonderful. Uh, and was the menu there yours? Um, the initial menu was not mine. Okay. We had worked with a cocktail consultant mm-hmm. um, who helped us train the staff okay. uh, and put together that first menu. Okay. Yeah. So this is part of part of the discussion. Part of what's interesting for me to talk to you about this is I can imagine the things that go into opening any business. Mm-hmm. You got to get permits. You got to get a liquor license. You got to get your vendors set up. But now you're doing this again mm-hmm. here what are the things that go into opening a bar that somebody who hasn't worked in that industry would have absolutely no idea yeah. that you have to worry about? I mean, part of it would be, you know, where you get certainly your menu. Do you make it up yourselves? Do you go with the standard? Yeah. Um, I mean, so essentially to open a bar and I think to do it successfully, mm-hmm. um, you really need to know who you are. Like, you really need to decide what the personality of that space is going to be. Gone are the days of just throwing open the doors and putting some bottles on the yeah. shelves. You know, yeah. it's like there are people um, all over who take this very seriously mm-hmm. and and they think through every detail and it's so intentional. And so having your story being authentic, a lot of similar things that go along with branding, but yep. but then to initiate those, you really have to have somebody to rely on if it's not you mm-hmm. that understands, yes, like what spirits do I need to carry in order to tell the story? Right. So for us, we're doing the low proof Mm-hmm. cocktails or 
Um, they've also been referred to as shims. Okay. Like you would level out uh-huh. a shelf yep. with a shim. All right. Um, or session, session cocktails as yep. well. So like now, I mean, I've been in this industry for a long time, but really opening sundry and vice is when I started to dive deep into spirits and mm-hmm. find my love of spirits. So I'm able to, from from that education yep. that I got for the past, you know, four or five years, take that and really move it into a new direction. Is that all making sense? Yeah, yeah. And so now I know, like, okay, I need to carry Amaro Lucano, which is what we're drinking, yep. um, along with any other Amaros, which is the Italian bittersweet liqueur. I need to ha- I need to find all these unique spirits that are under 40 proof. Right. So instead of going... 80 proof. Sorry. I want to be the the bar in Cincinnati that has the best single barrel bourbon mm-hmm. selection, yeah. which is 100 proof or above, if I'm right. Yep. That's not where you're... Not that you don't want to have those, but that's not where you're playing. Yeah. So you need to have this great selection of potentially yeah. lower alcohol cocktails right. that can make what you want. Right. So like if I were talking to somebody who's like, I want to have a the same, you know, I have the same idea, but like, how do I do that? I would be like, okay, well, I mean, like any, like any field, there comes the education with it, mm-hmm. like finding the resources, um, these spirits in particular are a little bit tricky because a lot of people already have this notion that they're gross, like they've had their grandmother's right. dry vermouth or something, and then they're like, oh, my gosh, no way. I will never drink vermouth again. Um, but more than likely, that vermouth has been sitting out, like, on their countertop for decades yeah. open, and vermouths go bad. <laughs> they need to be refrigerated. <laughs> Surprisingly, it's yeah, not, it's not which, good. Right. So, yeah, that's going to be terrible. Don't yeah. drink that. It's yeah. like a rotten apple. So <laughs> don't yeah. do that. Um, but, yeah, so there's just a lot of education that comes with being able to tell your your story right in the way you want it to be told. Um, yeah, and being intentional. Mm-hmm. And, like, how do you communicate that to other people? I think those yeah. are the the biggest things, some of the biggest things that you need to think about when you're opening a yeah. space and you're opening it up, opening your doors to whoever right. and letting them come in. How do you? Right. And, I mean, this is a competitive market. In the time that I've lived yeah. in Cincinnati, the number of bars in Over the Rhine, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I would guess quadrupled, <laughs> yeah. quintupled. Right. You know, and yeah. the, and a lot of them are very good and doing a very good job. So to open a new place, yeah. there has to be something. You don't just get to open your doors and say, we also have booze. Yeah. <laughs> there yeah. has to be something that yeah. draws people in. Right. And then I, one of the things that I feel like you've already done, uh, that you've always done really well, is the social media aspect of it, which has to be sort of a linchpin Thank to you. operating any bar these days. Yeah, definitely. I mean... That goes with telling your story. Yep. So, I mean, how do you tell your story to somebody who doesn't live in Cincinnati, who can't Mm -hmm. just, like, come through your doors and see what you're doing? Yep. Um, And it is super important, too, because, I mean, we're a 21 and up space, right? So I am not in my 20s anymore. So how do I connect with people who are in their 20s, and how do I get them to come and experience yeah. this new thing? Mm-hmm. Um, so you really, yeah, you really have to make sure you understand, and there are people who specialize in that, you know, like branding professionals or, yep. so, you know, those people that can help you tell your story. But. Yeah. So how did you know that that your time at Sundry and Vice was coming to an end? When did you f- first start to get that sense? Um, well... I am. A, I have a hard time being stagnant. I have a hard time. You know, I'm. I'm just like, I. I got to keep my. I got to keep learning. I got to keep growing. I, I, like. And and not to interrupt you, but throughout this whole process, at least judging from your Instagram feed, you're still doing design work. Yeah. You're still doing independent design contract <laughs> yeah. work. Yeah. So maybe that's something we can talk about as well. But this was this was it. You took on this huge project. You moved here to do this thing. Yeah. Even in that, it's obvious that you're yeah keeping other fires burning. Mover mover and a shaker. (laughs) Yeah. Look out. Um, Yeah. So basically, Sundream Vice, we opened. I mean, I was there 
hour, like hours. You know, the first year I lived there. Yeah. I couldn't even count how many hours I was there. Um, the second year, you know, you start to gain confidence and it's also a little bit of a control thing. You start being able to let go of control a little bit. Um, we got really lucky with our staff. We have at Sundry, we have an incredible staff who was really dedicated to us. And I mean, we hardly have had still, you know, any turnover. Mm. So once you have those people there that you trust, yeah. you know, especially with opening a bar uh, where there's liquor involved and right. cash, it's like it can be sticky, you yeah. know? Um, and it's really about building a culture in which there is trust yep. and then finding those people that you trust. So that happened with us and we were able to do that. And then, um, and then probably I would say two years into it is when I was like, okay. Getting itchy. Yeah. yeah. You know, I need something to do. So um, it was kind of perfect timing when a client that I had in LA um, decided to buy a house. And so I got a design job in LA so it was, it worked out that I had this staff that I could trust and then I could also do this other design project in LA, which was, right. I mean, I feel very blessed that I was able to have that opportunity to be able to take it. Cool. Um, and a year earlier. Staff. What's that? A year earlier, you probably don't get that chance. Yeah, no, right. You can't step away. Yeah, if you would have bought it like during that first year, not a chance, you know, yeah, you're yeah. going to have to go with somebody else, whatever. Um, but then after that finished, then I'm itchy again. Then I got, you know, so I started to look for spaces, um, around the neighborhood and look for design jobs. And I met Catherine Manabet, who is my partner now. Mm -hmm. Um, and just like upon meeting her, I just knew like, I was like, that chick is somebody that I want to be in business with. Right on. Yeah. So meeting her. Was she working at Watershed then or with 21C? I, she was working at Watershed when I met her. Okay. Yep. So she came in. That's how I met her. Actually, she was selling Watershed and she came in right. and then we had an event together and it was just like, you know. Should say Catherine is Julia's partner in opening Homemakers. Yes. She has been uh, around the Cincinnati. She worked for Watershed Distillery up in Columbus. She worked for the 21C Hotel here in Cincinnati. So that's who we're talking about. But that's, that's the person you meet. You say, I want to do something with you. Yep. Yes, okay. exactly. So this is really... Um, sort of the next step for me. Um, I love interior design, but my true passion for interior design is in hospitality yeah. or retail. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do have a residential project right now, which um, is in Clifton, and it's for uh, Ryan Morgan of 16 Bricks. A little shout out to you. Cool. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we're, we've been working on his house, and it's about wrapping up so nice. it's perfect timing for this project because this has really started I mean it it already has started to take over my life yeah um but yeah so so basically my whole like goal in life or like from when I was in LA and I started to go to design school and I was working hospitality my dream was like how do I combine these two like what so you knew even then each? that wasn't yeah. something that sundry and vice made apparent you already knew right. Design for hospitality. Yes, okay. exactly. So Sunder Advice was just the first opportunity that I had to do that, yeah. which was great. Um, and now here I am doing it again. So basically, it was just the next step mm -hmm. in my in my uh, walk. Okay, if you will. So how did you how did you communicate that to Stuart? How did you put that plan in motion, and how long did it take to make it a reality? Um. I would say um, I started to put the plan in motion, gosh, I guess March is four years of Sundry and Vice. So I feel like the, in total, this whole homemakers has been, um, I've been working on it for probably about two years. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't necessarily homemakers at the beginning. No, but from the concept. Right. Yeah. So it was just like, okay, how do I do this? How do how do I how do I be the big boss? Yeah. You know. Yep. So that was really that was something that was really important to me as an entrepreneur. Like, how do I how do I start a business? How do I do this on my own? Like, what tools do I need? Who do I need to meet? Right. And so basically at the beginning, it was very much um, building relationships, meeting the right people, 
talking to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and I have a few key people that were truly essential in helping me get to where I am. How? What, what, what did they provide for you that you didn't um, have? A lot of advice. Mm -hmm. I've got a lot of advice um, and a lot of connections, I guess. Mm -hmm. So just I have a few people that really believed in me without sounding cheesy. Oh. Um, and then they kind of like took me under their wing and introduced me to their circle. Um, I have a few people that I met that were just like, how can I help you? Like I do, I'm like, uh, I work for an investment firm and like, I'm not necessarily gonna invest with you, but like what, like, what tools can I give you right. that will help you succeed? Like call me, talk to me, you nice. know? So it was amazing. It was like truly one of the most incredible experiences to like have these people that cared enough to wanna like take the time Mm -hmm. out of their day to like call me on the phone and walk me through a spreadsheet of cool. something, you know? So yeah. that was a lot of the stuff that was really helpful. We've, we've talked uh, to different guests on the show about networking, which is kind of a dirty word, especially <laughs> if you're not an extrovert. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people get really creeped out by networking and a uh -huh. lot of a lot of events that have networking in their title are creepy yeah. events. But that idea of just building relationships with people and then seeing yeah. the fruit of those relationships pay off mm -hmm. because very often the people that you know want to be good people and want to help you out if they have skills. Yeah. I mean, that's all it is. That's all right. networking ultimately is. Right. It was incredible. And yeah, I am very much an introvert. Um, but so like even just before we started this podcast, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm not going to have anything to say. It's going to be like <laughs> dead air. And yet you are, and I'm, I'm not surprised by this because you're a person who has 200 people screaming for drinks <laughs> yeah. every night. Like, yeah. you know, yeah, that's you gotta, gotta be used. exhausting. <laughs> yeah. I think you, about you that, that would shut me down for days. Well, one of the cool things, um, I know this is kind of side note, but like one of the most amazing things about this hospitality industry, um, Bartending especially, I haven't spent as much time as a server, so mm -hmm. I can't really speak to that necessarily. But it forces you to come out of your shell. Mm -hmm. I know so many, like, nerdy, introverted people who, like, I've watched them, like, blossom into this beautiful, like, showpiece flower, yeah, you yeah. know? It's incredible. I love watching it. I love seeing people grow in new ways like right. that. Which doesn't mean you're not still an introvert at heart. Right. But that you can inhabit that yeah. part of yourself. Right. A lot of it's just performative. A lot mm -hmm. of it's putting on the lot, role and playing is, yeah. the part. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Um, but then a lot of it's stuff that you can take with you outside of. Yeah. The confidence to know that you can deal yeah. with something exactly. that you might be afraid would shut you down. Exactly. Yeah, you yeah. nailed it. Yeah. Yeah. So the process of you and Catherine, you came up with the idea first. You said to her. Let's do a thing together. So it, I slowly worked on I like chipped away at her. Um, she's not somebody who ever imagined herself owning a bar. Uh, but uh, I originally had this idea of opening a boutique liquor store mm -hmm. um, in which we could do cocktail classes, which is what she's really known for and great at, yep. um, and do like educations. And so that was the initial idea that I brought to her. Okay. And she was all in. Yeah. You reeled <laughs> so, her in a little bit, set the hook. Yeah. And then this is another fascinating process that maybe is for another day, but um, the Department of Liquor Control, they are run, it's run by the government. Mm -hmm. um, and there are only, the, the liquor agencies are all run by um Depart the government. Yeah. They all are, they contract them out, those mm -hmm. liquor stores. Um, so the only liquor license that exists are the only ones. So like. There are a finite number of them. Yes. And they're all out. Yeah. But last year they decided they were going to release a few more because liquor sales in state have, it's been rapidly growing. Mm -hmm. So I Government decides about it this. can make more money. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I get wind of this and I go through, um, actually, Catherine helped me put this application together. It was pretty rigorous. We put a full business plan, like a deck. Um, they asked for all these crazy things like 
They wanted the crime reports of the area. They wanted the parking. They wanted, like, dimensions of how far the guy would have to, like, wheel the liquor from the street to the... It Just was, to give you your license. Yeah, I mean, I'm telling you, like, if I could... It's, it was, like, a probably a inch and a half thick wow. package that I hand-delivered <laughs> into Columbus um, to apply for this thing. And then my application scored... I feel like I'm, like, going to get in trouble for talking about this. This is, like, undercover stuff. The government's listening. Uh, it's a, they, don't, they, don't, they don't listen. <laughs> they They're don't, not listening to you're us. Right. It's just the internet. You're, It'll go away. You're right. Yeah. It's not like the internet's forever. Uh, um, but anyway, so my application actually scored the highest in the area that I wanted to be, which is downtown. Okay. So, so what does that mean? It scored the highest, like, they, they could score you for other areas? Well, you applied for a certain, like, area. Okay. So there were, they, are, um, in Hamilton County, I think they released maybe two more, maybe three. I think it was just two. Okay. And one was, like, Hyde Park area, mm-hmm. and then the other one was downtown. Okay. So I applied for the one for downtown. Oh, gotcha. Um, and then they score it. And so... They told me that mine had scored the highest, and they called of, me. Of other applicants. Of other applicants. I, I, I Correct. Got it. Yes, okay. thank you. Um, and so then we had to go. They wanted us to meet the superintendent of the Department of Liquor Control, so we, you know, put our best business attire on uh-huh. to meet, go to the government. Drive up to Columbus. <laughs> yeah. Drive to Columbus, meet with them. The sp- superintendent didn't end up making it, and then we not only didn't get the license, but they just didn't give it to anybody. They didn't. They decided they didn't want a boutique liquor store. Okay. They also asked Catherine and myself if we were aware that there was going to be hard work involved. <laughs> so <laughs> I had to hold wow. Catherine back a little bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, so... Thanks, sexism. Yeah. <laughs> Smidge. And ultimately, I, I mean, am I understanding correctly that this decision... For both the future of your enterprise and a number of others who are who are also pinning their hopes on this liquor license <laughs> comes down to one dude in Columbus. Well, two, I think, yeah. Okay. But two, yes, there are two. Super. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> two fellas. Um, but anyway, okay, so so we do that. I get her on board. Mm-hmm. And then like during the whole time, I'm like, well, we're not gonna make enough money as just a boutique liquor store to stay afloat. So we're gonna have to have some sort of bar element in this. And then like, we didn't get that. And then it was like, so we're gonna have to open a bar. There you go. <laughs> and she was all in at that Switch. point. okay. Yeah, so right on. that's how I courted Catherine. <laughs> and then and then the, the process of coming up with the concept. Mm-hmm. That, yeah. How do you work that out? How long did that take? Were there, uh, were you guys just, just kind of relationally throwing things back and forth? Or yep. did you, like, yeah. present things to each um, other? Kind of both. We pre- we threw things back and forth. But, like, you know, I had had a concept already in my brain um, that I had been kind of floating around to different locations. Um, so that was sort of the initial concept. And then I kind of came to her and I was like, I just, I don't know if this is enough, you know? Mm. I don't know... If this is going to be... If the idea is strong enough? Yeah, if the idea is strong enough, exactly. Because I knew that, you know, this what's happening in the market down mm-hmm. here. I mean, there's so many places to go. Like, how do you set yourself apart? Yep. How do you, uh, you know, just just tell it. It really comes back to telling a story and yeah. creating an experience again. So how do we do that in such a unique way that offers something totally different than anybody else is offering. Mm-hmm. Um, and we knew who we were uh, as people. We knew that we had both, you know, moved here right? Um, and aren't from here. We started to call this place home. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're both, you know, Catherine is much more an actual homemaker, I would say, than I am. Um, but, you know, we both love creating things with our hands. Um, I'm from a family full of people who make things. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was just, Catherine actually brought the name to the table, and it was just, it was like, that, that's, that's it. That's great. That's it. Because it, it can't just be a good idea. It has to be a good idea you can inhabit and you can yeah. really bring to life. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So what are the, how, what's the division of labor between the two of you? What are the different roles? Um, so Catherine is going to be doing the food. 
will have a small food element, mm -hmm. um, and she is really going to be the one doing the cocktail classes and the events. Um, I mean, we're all going to, we're both going to do everything, yeah. of course, but like if I could separate us in such a way, um, Catherine will be more kitchen oriented food, um, and events. And then I'll be doing a lot of the bar training. Mm -hmm. I mean, we'll both be doing bar training. That's the thing. Catherine right. has more skills than me. I'm just designing the place and then, you know. <laughs> she might disagree with that. So talk a little bit about the process that you go through either here or elsewhere. You have, so people can, uh, Angie's been here taking photos. People can go on the website at the distillerpodcast.com and see that we are sitting in a shell of a building. We are sitting on a, on a dust covered construction table with hard hats. <laughs> and bricks and scaffolding all around us and holes in the floor. But it's, it's a place that is just, just pure possibility. Maybe let's start with how did you find the place? Um, how did you pick the location? Um, so I actually had my eye on this space for a while. Um, I came and saw the space like early on in Sundry's life, but it was just that side. Mm -hmm. I mean, Cause this is like two spaces that were basically literally used a saw twice the size of like us put like both of us put together tw times two yeah, yeah. to cut through this wall giant masonry saw to cut through <laughs> what i'm looking at it right now is five six seven layers of brick yeah <laughs> to cut the the opening between the two spaces it was really incredible um yeah this m massive like steel structure that they placed to hold up these That's two, build hold up all that two buildings. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I just saw one of the spaces early on, and it was so cool because it has this very historic arch yep. um, right to the middle of it. It's on a it's on the corner of 13th and Walnut. It has a historic storefront. They restored the exterior, so hmm. they restored all the like German lettering you see on the outside. They restored that to its natural state or original state. Um, we. I don't want to interrupt you, but yeah. we've talked. To, I've. I've had a couple of episodes in Over the Rhine. I, I think we've mentioned it before. Over the Rhine, if you're not aware of it, or if this is the first episode of the podcast you're listening to, is an area just north of downtown in Cincinnati. It's the largest intact historical district in the United States. If you saw the movie Carol, if you saw uh, the John Gotti movie that Travolta just did, like if people want to shoot movies that take place in 1950s Brooklyn, they shoot them in <laughs> Over the Rhine because it's this beautiful historic neighborhood. And as far as I can tell, the reason that it's all intact is because they didn't have the money to tear it down. Yeah. Like, whereas a lot so. of other urban areas tore all these buildings mm -hmm. down and then built new shiny stuff. Yeah. When the industrial era here died, there just wasn't the money to turn it over. And now it's this jewel. Yep. Um, so we are, we are right in the heart of it. So just to, to yeah. set the stage, that's, that's what you're talking about is not just an old building, but an old, a beautiful old building in a historical district that yeah. now you've stripped it back to the, to the brick and the studs and are making something right. beautiful inside yeah. of it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that, the location, mm -hmm. um, being neighbors with such great operators such as Longfellow and 16-bit and Sundry also just right down the street. Mm -hmm. um, and then seeing the beauty of the building, um, this original arch that exists. And then, um, and then we, we needed more space than just what is offered in, in, the, one, mm -hmm. in the one side. So Cut it open. Yeah, yeah. So 3CDC actually showed us both sides and they were like, we'll just put a hole through this wall. <laughs> It'll be no big deal. Just like that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sure. That's what they do. Yeah. So, I mean, there's so many reasons to like this location. There really yeah, yeah, are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so let's lean into the designer side of your brain. When you look at a space like this, I'm a creative, but I'm not really a visual creative. Talk to me through like how you walk through what your thought process is when you see this the first time and how you start to shape the visual ethos that will eventually become here. And then maybe talk about where you are. There's blueprints sitting right next to us. Where are you in that process right now of figuring out the look and the feel and the visual identity of this, this brand and this place? Yeah, so initially the idea comes from 
the story you're trying to create, which is the homemaker story, which is really, um, it's a celebration of the makers in the community. And it's also um, pulling from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Mm -hmm. So how do we take that story and merge it together? Um, and then I, I start with like the era first. So okay. I start dreaming of colors and materials and textures and a lot of Pinterest boards. Lots involved. of Pinterest, <laughs> lots of Pinteresting. <laughs> okay. Um, I promise uh, it won't just look like a Pinterest photo or hopefully it does actually, because sure. that would be great. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so that's kind of the initial thought, right? And then you start dreaming of, and then just me seeing the space, um, I kind of start to get a very vague idea of a layout. And we did work with the architects on the layout. Just the space in particular was pretty tough mm -hmm. um, because we did put two holes through two walls. Yeah. Um, but it's also not one large open space right. that you can just do whatever you want right. with it. You have exactly. to work with what exists. Yeah, exactly, yeah. which was quite challenging because uh, initially I wanted, you know, I had an idea of where I would want the bar to be because the door is going to be over in the uh, 13th and Walnut corner. And so you kind of want to walk in and like, look at this beautiful bar, right? right. That's the showpiece. But like that just couldn't, it physically couldn't be there. Yep. Um, so then we toyed around with, actually there were two essentially bar locations that we toyed around with. Um, and one was just kind of the obvious answer mm -hmm. um and then once you get that layout going you're you really are working from drawings yeah you know i mean you can come in here and you can take pictures and get the height of the ceiling but um it's more of a 2d kind of operation at that point yeah yeah and then um so then i mean you know i knew i wanted the bar here i knew what I wanted the bar top to be. I knew I wanted there to be moments that happen everywhere throughout the space, little moments, little details that just catch your eye that are like, huh, okay, cool, you know? So I started to think about those moments and where they should be. Mm -hmm. um, and also something that's really important is how do I make this space look different than anywhere else around? Yeah. Yeah. Um, because a lot of people, for good reason, use the natural beauty mm -hmm. of the space, um, which which we will, and we'll highlight some of those things. But but how do we make this space unique? How do we make this the homemaker space? Like yeah. how do we make it so you, when you walk in, you feel maybe like you're not even in over the Rhine anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you've stepped in. I don't know. Hopefully, you step back into like the '60s, right? Um, and want to cut a rug. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> uh, and have a few um, spritzers. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's that was another big goal. Um, I'm imagining that you know, like the sort of Mad Men. You can do the cocktails all day if they're not all mm -hmm. hundred proof. Yeah, I don't know how they did that with those Manhattans all day. Yeah, I don't know how you got any work done. But that's part of the that's part <laughs> of the vibe that like you're you're building in my mind is this classic era where you're sipping on something. Yeah. Enjoying something yes. that is not overpowering. You. Right. Yeah. yeah, it's a little paying a little bit of uh, homage to like the '50s cocktail parties at mm -hmm. home. Right. Um, but without being so on the nose. Yeah, yeah. And then we're living it, we're making it a little more lively. Cool. So it's not necessarily going to be like a mid-century right. um, den with, you know. It's just not going to be straight retro. Yeah. For its own sake. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm hoping I can pull this off. It's like my second album. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it well, your is. first album was a hit, but I, that sophomore slump is in, is in danger. <laughs> <laughs> no. no, but, I, you know, first, first of all, obviously you have, seeing what you did with Sundry and Vice um, and the other work that you've done, there's every reason to believe that you, can, that you can pull this off. What are you, right now, what are you most excited about? Like, what part of what's going on all around us that when you get to talk to people about it makes you, gives you goosebumps? Um, design specific? Anything. Or just anything. Of being, the whole process. Being open. <laughs> yeah. Just the idea of looking forward to that. Um, I, you know, my head, I feel like my head is, it's being pulled in so many directions. I really have to, I have to like turn off from the world, like to focus on design. I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, I'm not answering any other email, 
unless it's related to interior design specifically. I'm going to yeah. sit here with myself, like secluded. Right. Like, and just like, because I really do need to like sum, submerge, submerge Both. myself. Both. But, it's a, but yeah. it's a creative, I totally get that. It's a creative process. Yeah. You need to sort of, you know, marinate in it. Yeah. For a little while. Yeah. And I do feel kind of lucky, like, I mean, and why I think I'm, you know, I'm able to do interior design is I can, like, I can, like you said, when you look at it, you, you don't, you're not necessarily a visually creative person. I can, like, I can look at that wall right now and, like, t like imagine exactly what's going to be, like, you know, like the plants that hang down, the color on the wall, the chair that's going to be in front of it. It's like, like, I really can yeah. just, like, put myself there. I'm sure a lot of interior de designers can do it, but I think, you know. No, that's wonderful. That's the, that's, I love to hear you say that because I, I, I probably, I mean, if if I was trying to, you know, they say that uh, whatever Mozart could could hear the whole symphony in his head, all of the different little pieces. It's akin to that, mm. like you're building well, it in your. Well, so I'm like Mozart. There yes. you go. That's exactly what I'm saying. Thank you for getting the compliment. But that ability, yes, to to be able to envision the thing, and put it together in your head is kind of magical and wonderfully creative. It's the kind of thing that. Uh, you can't imagine a type mm. of creativity that you don't really inhabit, but to like get a little glimpse of mm. the way that you imagine this space. And I really do yeah. want people, I mean, right behind you are two, I assume those were garage doors? Um, no, actually they were. Um, or, or did you cut those out? No, there, there were, they were windows. Okay. Um, but one at one point had like a little to go, I think it was a to go ice cream. Shop Fantastic. or something. So okay. there was like a little window that slid open. Okay. Like that. Um, and li literally last week, if we would have done this last week, you would have saw those. <laughs> yeah. But now they're just they're just boarded up because <laughs> yeah. they're big open spaces, you know, yeah. what, 10 feet high by about six feet wide. I mean, yeah. the, the thing is really just like this beautiful blank canvas. It's great. Yeah. I mean, it's cool and scary and it's definitely the biggest project I will say that I have done, yeah. you know, on my own. So do you, do you enjoy that part of it? Um, like the, 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 for lack of a better word, like the pressure of this is your deal. I work well under pressure. Do you? Yeah. Okay. I'm really good with like, I always need deadlines because like, otherwise my brain will just go off in la la land. But mm -hmm. like when I have like, do you procrastinate? Yes. You wait until it's I like do. you put the pressure on yourself to yeah. do it. Yeah. Yeah. But I can't with this space. I mean, because really I do feel the pressure. I do yeah. feel like this is my second album or something. And, yeah. and so I, with the de interior design specifically, I'm really trying to stay on top of it and ahead because I really want to make sure one thing that I do just in the, my creative process, I'm sure a lot of people do the same is like, I come up with all these ideas and then I keep going to make sure that like, I know that the one that I think is the one is actually mm -hmm. the one. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that that goes along with design for sure. So like yeah. you know, I'll imagine what I want the space to look like. I'll put it on paper. I'll you know, I'll draw it in AutoCAD. I'll do like a little perspective of it, and then I'll keep going and trying different things just so I'm like really positive. That, you know, that's yeah. the one. Yeah. No regrets. Yeah, Hopefully, yeah. until you know, <laughs> until you open the doors and somebody's like, "You did what?" <laughs> and then I'm like, "But there's a reason." There's a, let me tell you the story. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> let me tell you what you should be getting from that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, uh, uh, you obviously you're very thoughtful behind the execution of it and the thought that you've put into uh, the name and all of those things when you. The, the philosophical component of your work, like what do you, do you think about sort of what you're providing for people and what you want them to experience and how, yeah. how big a part of it um, is that? It's a huge part. It's like kind of the reason I do it, mm -hmm. you know? Um, I love, I mean, why interior design was, when I started to do it and go to school, I was like, oh, like, like, why haven't I been doing this already? You know, mm. I just, I love one, I am very visual, but like creating a space for people to experience mm -hmm. is like magical to me. Mm. It is. So, I mean, my, I mean, I grew up with my mom. She was like always 
changing everything around. And I think there's a lot of people that can say that. And I think probably a lot of people who care about their environment probably say that as mm-hmm. well about what it looks like and how it feels and how it makes you feel. Um, so, so that's one of the major reasons why, why I fell into interior design. And then like, I can take it even further now with hospitality. Like, not only can I create the space that you walk into and, and how it makes you feel when you step into the room, but now I can also have who you interact with help create your space right. and what you taste hmm. help create that experience for you. So like all of these elements and like what, you, what you're listening to, how does that make you feel, you know? So this is like literally creating, like, like, Brandon, you step in and, like, I want him to feel, you know, I want him to, like, start dancing. You know, how do I get him to, like, be happy and start dancing? Right, right. Which is, like, a big goal for this space. Wow. In particular. Yeah. The sundry, it's, like, a little bit more conversational, right? Sure. But but here, I want you to, like, step in. I want you to see, like, these bright colors that make you happy. The music's going. The bartender greets you immediately. Like, you have something that's, like, bubbly, like an aperitif. Mm -hmm. You know, something that, like, ignites your taste buds, and then, like, the music's playing. There's a vinyl DJ in the back, you know? And you're like, all right, you know, this is this is a happening place. This is yeah, where I want to yeah. be, so I want to spend some time here. I love that. Yeah. So it's very much about people, other people, and, and how do I, um, I don't know, like, show them something new or mm-hmm. show them. Yeah, you, I, well, you I said that, experience a lot. But. Yeah, you said that you and Catherine sort of started describing the place as home, Mm -hmm. what kind of, is there a word that you want your, when somebody walks in here, you've talked about a lot of actions. Is there like, when somebody leaves, like, what do you want the hallmark of this place to be on their mind? I don't want them to want to leave. (laughs) There you go. That's a great answer. I want them to want, you know, like, it's like when you go home or, you know, you go to, I don't know, let's, home is like a perfect example. I mean, and it can be any, any place can be considered like it doesn't have to be like where your mom and your dad are necessarily mm-hmm. like you like you know my home that I created or like your home that you created like it's just like you a sense of belonging you yeah. know which is also like for Catherine she brought this to the table really just like um opening up to the community and like collaborating with everybody in the neighborhood mm-hmm. you know we really want this to be <laughs> For lack of the sounding ridiculous because it's a bar, like a community center, you yeah, know? Yeah. So, like, we'll have posted on the wall, like, events that are happening in the neighborhood and mm. collaborations, you know? So, the sense that was, like, a really a roundabout way to come back to, um, I want them to think home. Yeah, no, that makes perfect <laughs> sense. And I love... It's really interesting because I haven't, uh, this is not my world. I don't put a lot of thought into what it takes to start a bar. Mm -hmm. I think I would have assumed, and maybe it's true of other places, that some some places, we won't name any places like this, are about I want people to spend a lot of money. And of course you you need to make a profit and you need to be, you know, but, but like... As long as I keep the drinks flowing, people are going to be spending money. I don't hear any of that in yeah, your description. No. I hear you talking about a, a, a homey vibe. You know, the very first thing that you said was that you want to honor this quality in people. All of that is a mm-hmm. really uh, surprising and wonderful Yay. thing to hear about somebody that's creating a space like that's this. Awesome. Well, also, another reason why that, like, why I feel that way so strongly as well is... Um, I'm not the first one to say this, but um, like a bar or a saloon, even like in the 1800s, was mm-hmm. kind of like the community center. Right. And it was like the third space. Yep. And I feel like I've grown up in a bar or restaurant, mostly like bars, that, like pubs. Yeah. You know, um, but but like it is my third space. Like I do feel at home in these spaces. I will go to any bar and sit there by myself and chat with the bartender. So how do I kind of share that? How do I, how do I create a space in which somebody else can feel this same way about my space? Yeah. 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 And it's interesting as well, uh, that you've talked about other bars around town 
I, I have used the word competition. You haven't. You have only ever talked about the other bars in town as friends and colleagues and people that have helped you yeah. learn. And that idea that is crowded a city as this is mm -hmm. for bars, as competitive as the landscape is, because it, it's growing saturated, that you still have this community feel, even yeah. with the other people that are opening their places. There's a place for everybody's individual Absolutely. story and you're trying to find a yours. rising tide. Yep. There you go. <laughs> well, it's, it's wonderful. I can't wait to see it. Now I'm sad that I, that we all have to wait so long <laughs> yeah. to see it open. Well, you'll just have to, you'll have to host another podcast in the space when it's complete. I would be very, very happy to. Uh, we awesome. will definitely do that. So uh, June, there's not a there's not a set date. No way, no June. how. Okay. I'm not going to be that fool. <laughs> that would be dangerous. <laughs> That's dangerous. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. But we will look forward to it, and we'll look forward to the episode of The Distiller recorded in the completed Homemaker's yes. Bar awesome. sometime in the future. Thank you so much. It's truly amazing that you asked me to be a part of this. Oh, it's great. I really, like, you know, it's cool. My thanks pleasure. So My yeah. pleasure. Thanks for taking the time and thanks for letting us kind of get a, a peek behind the <laughs> Even curtain. Even though we had to borrow chairs. <laughs> <laughs> Even though we had to borrow. And thanks to the guys down at 16-Bit yeah, for right. letting us borrow the chairs. That's right. Thank you, Julie. I really appreciate Thank it. Thank you. This episode of The Distiller was recorded live at the future site of Homemaker's Bar, opening, hopefully, this June at the corner of 13th and Walnut in Over the Rhine, Cincinnati. Thanks again to Julia Pettiprin and her business partner, Catherine Manabat, for giving us a glimpse behind the scenes, not only into her physical location, but into the process of creating this new venture. I hope it was as interesting for you as it was for me. You can visit our website at thedistillerpodcast.com to see photos of our conversation and the construction in progress. It's a beautiful space, even just as bricks and studs. And knowing Julia, it's going to be breathtaking when they open up. Of course, watch for announcements later this year for when homemakers bar is open for business, we'll be sure to notify you on the distiller's Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram pages when Julia, Catherine, and the team are open for business. The Distiller is produced, recorded, and hosted by me, Brandon Dawson. Our show is mixed and edited by Justin Golden. Photos for this episode are by Angie Lipscomb of Angie Lipscomb Photography. Our logo was designed by Scott Ryan, and our videos are by Mike Helm of Minute Moments Pictures. You can find The Distiller wherever you listen to podcasts, and you can listen and download every episode at thedistillerpodcast.com, where you can find links, photos of the guests, and a map of all of our show locations. If you like what we're doing, please follow, like, and share our posts on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. And if you'd like to help support us in creating the show, go to the distillerpodcast.com and click on the become a patron button for more information. And finally, we love it when you rate and review the distiller wherever you listen, that helps us get the word out about the show. You can always get in touch with us at mail at the distillerpodcast.com. Please do let us know who you think should be on the distiller to talk about their search for meaningful work or where you think we should record the next episode, whether it's by email on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Drop us a line. We love to hear from you. Until next time, I'm Brandon Dawson, and thanks for listening to The Distiller. Bye-bye.